In a lot of fiction, magic is pretty mechanical. Sure, it may be weird and volatile, but it more or less works how and when you want it to. Drink a health potion, your wounds heal. Recite the magic words, summon the monster. Unsheath your fire sword. Fire. More or less predictable outcomes. Some stories even take that to the extreme and make an entire system out of their magic. This table you're looking at right now describes just one type of magic from Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. Look how intricate this is. And this is just a basic surface level breakdown. It gets far more complicated than this. As creatives, it's pretty easy to think of magic this way. A lot of fantasy authors do. But when you break out of the conventions of high fantasy and think more broadly about what magic really is, what we mean by using this word, a confusing phenomenon reveals itself. Throughout all of these systems, fantasy rulebooks, magical laws, it almost seems like the more you know about the magic you're using, the less magical it is. Got a really great idea for a story, but don't quite know how to put it all together? Well, there's a 12-part class you can take for free that I think will really help. It certainly helped me. Creating Unique and Powerful Worlds, taught by many-time author and professor of fiction Lincoln Michelle. Check the description to see how you can get access to it and finally get your story project going without spending a dime. A big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and giving us the opportunity to tell you about it. This class has been a really special one for me, and I feel really lucky to get to share it with you this way. Definitely check it out when you have the chance. Here, let me paint you a picture. Four little hobbits, Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin, have found their way to Lothlorien, the realm of the elves. They stand astonished, surrounded by the ancient and towering trees, the ethereal silver lights swaying from the boughs, the impossible depth of the night the countless stars shining down on them through the leaves. There's not an elf in sight, but their magic can be felt everywhere. Taken with all of this, Sam utters that he'd like to see some true elf magic for himself, firsthand. And, fortunately for him, Galadriel, the Lady of the Wood, is happy to oblige. One evening, while they're staying as guests in her realm, Frodo and Sam are beckoned to look into what she calls her mirror. A mysterious basin of water which, according to her, will show them each a vision meant only for them. Perhaps it will show them their beloved home, the Shire, which they are so very far away from. Perhaps it will show them something to come on their journey, prepare them for when they must once again leave the safety of the wood. It's a gift she's offering them, miraculous and powerful. But the two hobbits hesitate. They are only hobbits, after all. They aren't used to such things and Galadriel's power scares them. Did you not say you wished to see elf magic? She says, turning to Sam. For this is what your folk would call magic, I believe, though I do not understand clearly what they mean. They do end up looking, by the way, and what they see impacts their journey deeply, but that's not what I want to talk about here. What's always stood out to me about this sequence is this strange thing, Galadriel says, this moment where one of the most powerful Magical beings in their world admits to them that she doesn't know what magic is. Something even hobbits, the smallest of all the world's peoples, understand intuitively. It's a fleeting detail in the three volumes and more than a thousand pages which make up the Lord of the Rings, but also one of the most poignant to me. Because I think this is how most people see magic. Think of a magician performing a trick for a child. With a sparkle in his eye and a theatrical flourish, he removes his top hat. The child watches as he demonstrates that it is, in fact, empty inside. She watches as the magician puts it down on a table nearby. And then she watches in pure wonder as the magician reaches his hand in a bit further than he should be able to and pulls out a live rabbit. Magic, right? That was magic. It had to be, at least through the child's eyes. To her, this guy just shattered the laws of physics. A complete impossibility. Hats aren't that deep, 
and a rabbit definitely wouldn't be able to live inside of one for very long. Everything she knows about the universe thus far tells her that what she just witnessed cannot be. Yet, there it was. Magic. For that moment, this child is a hobbit in the elves' wood. But, like Galadriel, the magician doesn't see it. Although he's the one performing it, to him it's less magic and more trick. Because, unlike the child watching, he knows how it all works. He knows about the hole in the table and the compartment underneath, just big enough for a rabbit. He knows how to push open the bottom of the hat to reach through. He knows that the laws of physics are, in fact, still perfectly intact. For him, there's no leap of logic, no seeming contradiction in the nature of perception and the nature of reality. He experiences no magic. Both of these little case studies lead me to an interesting conclusion about the nature of this thing that we call magic. It seems to me that magic is not just a matter of perspective, but also a matter of understanding. The more empirical, rational, systematic it is in the mind of the beholder, the less magical it appears to be. The trick is just an illusion to the magician, but a breach of physics to the child. The mirror is just a powerful tool to Galadriel, but elf magic to the hobbits. Even the most mundane things can appear magical to someone who lacks context. Imagine if a creature from some tiny, isolated woodland came to visit your modern, industrialized world and started calling things like water fountains and mechanical pencils human magic. As Arthur C. Clarke famously put it, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, a phrase underpinned by the idea that magic represents a gap in understanding. But... I also don't think that's the whole story. It makes sense to me that magic requires a gap in our understanding, but that also just kind of seems like a condition for it to exist rather than what it actually is. If not getting it were enough to make a thing magical, then every beginner at every task would technically be a wizard in training, every student who ever failed a math problem or a science experiment would technically be having a magical experience. Think back to our magician. What if he were to perform the same trick, but this time for an adult? He might wow them, sure, evoke a moment of wonder, surprise, curiosity, fascination. But after that moment passes, they'll almost certainly immediately ask themselves, how did he do that? How was the trick performed? They assume that this thing that they just witnessed works, that it makes sense, that it's somehow possible. Even if they don't get how it was done, they know implicitly that it was done within the laws of physics. Unlike the child, unlike the hobbits, the adult rejects the impossibility of what they've just seen out of hand. This time, when the trick is performed between the magician and the adult, there is not one single speck of magic. And that's because magic is not a phenomenon. It's not a thing you do, not an action or a system or a set of laws. Magic is... acceptance. The moment of true belief that you are witnessing something which, by your established systems of understanding, should not, cannot, be. A gap in understanding can make that more likely to happen, because a smaller, less inclusive system is easier to violate. But the gap itself is not the magic. If you assume there's some rational explanation for a thing you don't yet understand, it's not magical, it's just thus far unknown. But when you accept that you've genuinely observed something that really does violate any model or system that you would otherwise use to explain it, that is magic. And that kind of puts magic systems in a weird spot, because if what we've come to here is true, then that means magic cannot exist in a system. Magic is, fundamentally, system-breaking. That's what makes it magical. Of course, we also love a good magic system. We've done a few videos on them already, and we're probably going to do a whole lot more in the future. But if magic and systems are kind of polar opposites, that does make things a little awkward for these very explicit, systemized, hard magic, Brandon Sandersonian approaches to it. They are fascinating, spectacular. Narratively, they can do almost anything a softer, less structured magic system like the one in Lord of the Rings can do. Heck, sometimes they can do a whole lot more. But the one thing they can't really do be magical. Any sufficiently advanced technology may be indistinguishable from magic, but likewise, any sufficiently advanced magic is also indistinguishable from science. 
These hard magic systems, with their rationality and rules and detailed inner workings, are really a lot more akin to an alternative, secondary world science. The stories surrounding them tend to be a lot less about experiencing magic, and a lot more about exploring the fascinating what-ifs these alternative rule sets enable. And it really is a blast to watch the characters figure it all out, turn these new rules to their advantage. It's a similar feeling to the one you might get when figuring out how to employ a magical power in a video game. It's not the wonder of the hobbits in Lothlorien or the child watching the magic trick we're feeling in these moments. It's the very real, moving gratification of solving a puzzle. But if you do want to feel that magic, look to less systemized approaches. Soft magic instead of hard magic, as some like to call it. When you leave the workings of these new rules and powers vague, when they're allowed to be a little less rigidly defined and a little more fluid, it puts the audience in a headspace a little closer to that of the child watching the magic trick. In Harry Potter, we're not following Dumbledore or Voldemort, we're following a child encountering magic for the first time. In The Wizard of Oz, we're not following the good witch Glinda or Oz himself, we're with Dorothy, looking at this fantasy world with fresh eyes. Most of the time in Lord of the Rings, we're not following Gandalf or Galadriel, we're experiencing things as a hobbit would, through eyes which see elf magic as strange and rule-breaking and awesome. Enjoy world-building, enjoy magic systems, enjoy finding clever ways to explain all the weird stuff that happens in your stories, but also remember that the most powerful magic happens when we simply accept that it cannot be explained. However, even an inherently magical world still has some rules. Being okay with magic just being magical doesn't necessarily answer the question of complexity with all your other world building, does it? It can be hard to figure out how this whole fictional world thing works, but fortunately, I recently found something that will absolutely help you. It's a 12-part video series called Creating Unique and Powerful Worlds, taught by many-time author and professor of fiction, Lincoln Michel. He walks you through how to begin your new world, what the ripple effects of that starting idea will be like across your world, how to create themes within your world, how to create characters to experience the world you've made, and then finally, how to put all of these things together. The prospect of creating an entire world can be really paralyzing, but it doesn't have to be. This course will absolutely help bring the size of the task down to something you can really understand and manage. I can say from personal experience that it is so liberating just to have a roadmap for a project like this. And thanks to our sponsor Skillshare, you can actually watch it for free. I personally would sign up for this course alone, but you also get access to thousands of other classes as well. Experts from pretty much every discipline have gathered there to share their knowledge and experience. There are classes on creative writing, illustration, fine art, animation, graphic design, film and video, pretty much anything you can imagine. You can even join in on live classes, connecting with other creators and teachers while you learn. After talking to them about it, it seems like the people over at Skillshare can see why we're so excited about this writing class, so they've decided to give you the opportunity to experience it and any other Skillshare class that catches your interest for free. This month, the first 1,000 Tail Foundry fans who join the Skillshare community will get not just the usual 15-day trial for free, but a full 30-day trial, an entire month of free learning and expert guidance on all the creative things you ever wanted to do. Click the link in the description or the link right at the end of this video to get started. And I would definitely hurry, because those slots are going to fill up fast. Once you've finished this class, creating unique and powerful worlds, please come back and tell us the impact it's had on you as a storyteller. I cannot wait to hear the success stories. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye!